interpretive dance. Um, interpretive dance. And I mean the subtitles. There we go. Now we can hear you. Dang, well, you're saved from the interpretive dance then. Um, that is not a hollow thread. I have a degree in dance. So I have done many interpretive dances in my life. But that is not what we're here for today. <laughs> we are here to talk with my wonderful guest, Malka Older. Um, thank you for joining us today. Uh, as part of the uh, World Builders uh, Indiegogo, um, our yearly uh, fundraiser to keep our lights on. And we really appreciate that you're helping us. You've been here and you've supported us in the past as well. But for the three people who are new to the stream, I'm gonna read your biography anyway, just in case there's somebody who doesn't know who you are. Um, Maka Older is a writer, aid worker, and sociologist. Her science fiction political thriller, Infomocracy, was named one of the best books of 2016 by Kirkus, Book Riot, The Washington Post, and Gray Miller, executive director of World Builders. Um, I just added that part in because it is an amazing trilogy. Uh, she's also the creator of the serial Ninth Step Station, which is currently running on, I think it's called Realm now, correct? Formerly Serial Box. Yeah, I um, would update my bio. <laughs> and, and her short story collection and other disasters came out in November, 2019. She's currently a faculty associate at Arizona State University School for the Future of Innovation in Society. And her opinions can be found in the New York Times, The Nation and Foreign Policy among other places. And I highly recommend that you read all of her, those pieces because they will make you think. Um, wow. Uh, uh, and, and I also wanna give a shout out to Arizona State University. Uh, I did some work back in the day with Ellen Bromberg from the dance department there. Um, you guys have a really amazing uh, dance department in that in that uh, in Phoenix. So anyway, um, sorry, you got sidetracked there. Uh, but the, the New York Times article, uh, Beth has posted in there already. And I guess I'm actually not going to start there. I wanted to talk about pistachios um, and a tweet that you put up about pistachios. Yes, um, a trucker stole 42,000 pounds of pistachios for black market resale. And apparently that was a threat to the entire industry. Is that what, what they came to? Well, I, you know, I'm a little stuck on whether this was just sort of like a lazy, you know, this is a way for us to talk about it in general because there've been more thefts of pistachios. Um, or whether it really is like, you know, whether it's intentional or not, these kinds of framings where they say it's, you know, it's very much like the other thing that drives me nuts is when people talk about, when articles talk about the economy, like, is this bad for the economy? There's some things that are bad for the entire economy, but mostly when they say that they're talking about it being bad for certain segments of the economy, the segments that they care a lot about. Um, and so, you know, to talk about these giant abstract things First of all, like they're monoliths. And secondly, like they're important for their own sake. Um, like why we should care whether the pistachio industry, uh, you know, and, and, and suggesting that it's a threat to the industry. Is it really a threat to the industry, to the existence of pistachio sales? It could be, but I don't think it is. It's a threat to the way the industry is structured right now, which is in fact, you know, hugely unequal and has all these, um, sort of idiosyncrasies that have been developed by people who had the power to develop them in their own favor. And so it's actually, you know, possibly a good thing that there's a threat to this particular structuring of the industry. I don't know enough, enough about the pistachio industry to know, but, you know, the fact that people can steal $42,000 worth of pistachios in a truck and then and then retail it basically a bit cheaper than what pistachios sell for kind of suggests that the market has some problems. Yeah, it seems like the existence of a black market in the uh, industry means that there must be something wrong with it because otherwise if the market was functioning the way, I mean, isn't, isn't that the invisible hand of the market at work? Yeah, and, and that's not even considering sustainability and the amount of water that's used in this. And, you know, so, uh, so yeah, I mean, I think it's, this is, okay, kind of, you know, my brand, Infomocracy, paying attention to the way that the information we consume is framed, where we get it from, and what they're really saying. But yeah, it does, um, it does really bother me when I read things that 
kind of, you know, presume that we want the status quo to continue as is, and that that is the good outcome, as opposed to change for the better. Right. Um, and I, I mean, we're going we're gonna to mention infomocracy a lot, I think, so we should probably give a, like a, a sort of a synopsis Effect. of things. First of all, everybody go out there and read it anyway. Um, but uh, it, it, I will also say, when you read it, it's a dense, it is dense. I, I read it and, and when it was like uh, the equivalent of eating a, um, a very rich truffle chocolate dessert. Like, cause you, you pack in so much brain, brain stuff and then lots of action and have these whole different um, ideas of, of the uh, sort of balkanization of the world into different areas of um, voting blocks. Um, uh, and I think that the one part that I uh, thought that I, uh, that, that was the, the part that was the most science fiction-y sort of along the lines of warp drive and, you know, faster than light travel and, oh, look, I'll just make this science doohickey that does what I needed to do, was the idea that there was a, a source of information that people could use to just understand what, it, what the real situation is and understand how to interpret the statistics and things like that. I, I wish it was, I wish it worked that way. I wanted that world so much, um, but, I, but I read your stuff before the last presidential term and I, now I just kind of despair. Um, how do you feel about that? Well, I mean, the difference between it and I don't know, faster than light speed travel, which who knows, we might get to at some point, but True. you know, this, the, the, the world that I present for the most part is totally plausible with the technology we have today. Um, that I, I invent some cool technology in the book. There's some really fun stuff, but most of the world building doesn't depend on that. Uh, and most it kind of facilitates it. So we could do the, the totally different governance system, which I call micro democracy in the book, and also this mm -hmm. approach to information. Um, the only thing that stands in our way is political will, as they say, or entrenched interests. It is, That's what you say. I mean, I mean, the technology, sure, that exists. It's the humanity. It's, it's, you know, our decision. Work. Yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, it's, which I don't know, like, I don't know if that makes us more hopeful or less hopeful. Like the fact that it could exist and it doesn't, or the fact that it could exist. Uh, I don't know which is worse. Yeah. Well, so, and that's the whole topic of this is supposed to be, you know, imagining a, uh, um, a better, uh, imagine what well, speculative resistance is the way is the title of this, uh, imagining a better future. And I'm going to reference the New York times article that, um, Beth posted in there, uh, assuming I can pull it up. There it is. Okay, pull the right tab. Um, so in the in the thing you you said, as a science fiction writer, part of my job is to reimagine institutions for the future worlds I create. And to do this, I peel off layers of embedded assumptions and reverence uh, and pinpoint what the institutions we live by are supposed to do and how they do it differently. Um, and it, it reminds me of the, the whole, um, uh, in the nonprofit world, one of the things that we try and pay attention to, and I'm not as up on it as I should be, is systems theory. And, and one of the functions of systems theory is that any system will, whatever the system, system's output is, that is what the system is designed to do. It may not be what you intended the system to do, but that is what it is designed to do. And so if, if you have a system and you're like, I don't like the way this is working, what's coming out of this, you can't blame the system, you'd have to change it. Um, and uh, so I guess um, my question for you is how do, we, how do we identify the difference between uh, the status quo that needs to be disrupted and you know, there's just the idea, like, how do you convince people that they have, and they have, what they're imagining should change is, is the system and not just the output? I'm not sure yeah. if that's a real clear question, but. Not super clear, but really important. Okay. Uh, so <laughs> let's go with it. Um, so, I mean, there's, and there's a couple of different sort of places that I want to go with this, but let's start with when, when I wrote Infomocracy, really one of the things that I wanted to come out of that book, and it sounds like for you at least it worked, was to get people thinking about processes and like 
the, the, the sort of changes that we can make in systems themselves. So like, instead of fighting over, um, you know, which party should win, uh, it's thinking about how do we run our elections and why do they end up such a mess? Why do they cost so much money, take so much time and give us such really crap options at the end of the day? Uh, I mean, come on. Uh, so, you know, I wanted to really kind of push this, uh, this idea of like things could be really different. And so to answer the kind of broader question behind your question, I think a big part of what we need to do to get people thinking, first of all, that change is possible. And secondly, you know, that it can happen through systems is to imagine systems running differently. Um, because, you know, to take this, this example of democracy, it's very easy for people to say, well, you know, we have a democracy. So what could we do differently? Until you show people that the way you count votes will actually change the results, even if you have the same number of votes for each of the, the, the candidates. And so, you know, giving this demonstration of how it would look if it were different uh, is, is, is a first really important step. And that's, you know, our job as speculative fiction writers, whether it's science fiction, whether it's, you know, alternate history, whether it's fantasy, all of these things enable us to imagine the world as a different place. And if we do our jobs properly and we write plausibly, you know, if we write characters that make sense to people and we do world building that is coherent and makes sense to people, then, then those alternate, those, those possible futures or presents, um, you know, they, they, they click with people. They say, yeah, this could actually happen. People would behave this way if these circumstances were as such. And that makes it feel, you know, our brains are, are very wired for narrative. Yes. You know, they're wired for imagining uh, what will happen for planning. Um, and so having something, as long as we do it right, and it, and it does feel that people get that possibility, people inhabit those characters and identify with them, then we can really open up a lot of possibility that people otherwise can just simply not see as they're, you know, dealing with all the multiple stuff they have in their lives and, and also dealing with the, the ingrainedness of the status quo and of path dependency, which it's, it's really very hard to see around or through or, or, um, yes. or imagine differently. And so that's, you know, I, I really do think that that's a big part of our jobs. I, it's, uh, it's, it's funny in, in another life, I, I talked a lot about, um, uh, techniques for communicating within relationships. And, and one of the tools that we use is the, the phrase, I'm telling myself the story that. So, mm. so rather than saying, you know, um, you're mad at me, uh, you say, I'm telling myself the story that you're mad at me. And mm. um, that, that's kind of a micro version of that whole narrative disorder. And did, are you, did you come up with that term? Is that, was that an original piece for you? Uh, I did. I can't swear that nobody else has come up with it independently, but yes. I, mean, uh, I want to keep looking for it in the DS5 and things like that. You know, um, <laughs> like I, uh, can you, can you briefly explain what you mean by narrative disorder? Sure. So this is a term I use in infomocracy. There's also a free short story um, with that title that has some, a bit of, a bit of a origin story for one of the characters in infomocracy um, and an essay that accompanies that both the short story and the essay are, are in fireside. Uh, and so available free online if you just search. Um, so narrative disorder is a, a syndrome that I very much suffer from. Uh, and that most people do at some point on the spectrum, right? Some people more than others, me a lot. Uh, and it has a sort of two main characteristics, two main symptoms. One is an addiction to narrative. And I think we really see this in this world we live in where there is more recorded canned narrative available than we could possibly consume. You know, whether you're talking about books or movies or TV shows or both or plays or recorded plays, you know, there's so much out there. Uh, and yet <laughs> we are desperate for the next one, right? We're always waiting for the ne next thing that's gonna come out. The production facilities cannot keep up with it. Uh, which is why they rehash old ones and that and wanting to make money without too much effort or paying writers. You know, they reboot, they sequel, they, they remake. Um, and so we see like this, this churning out of narrative constantly uh, and because we're all addicted to it. And you see then that narrative also becomes um, this certain narrative tropes particularly uh, become very pervasive in societies and times and places. So you know, we are seeing narrative used not only in fiction, 
but the way that nonfiction, um, the way that news stories are framed is often very narrative. This person did this and this happened. And by the way, at the end, there's a sort of twist or curl of some kind that you know, makes the sad thing a little bit happier, the happy thing a little bit worrying, or, um, and there's, you know, a moment of drama at which point they can, they can get our attention and then shift to the interview to, you know, there's the, there's the, the clickbait <laughs> motion of narrative. Um, yeah. And the, the, so the second part of, of narrative disorder is that when you're consuming a lot of narrative and particularly when you're consuming it within, you know, the parameters of what we might call one society or one sort of cultural moment, you start to see the world, real life, very much through the narrative structures that you are so accustomed to. And by narrative structures, I'm talking about like everything from pacing to, uh, to you know, I think a big narrative disorder thing is the way that character actors are chosen in for movies and the sort of types, physical types that we align then with certain jobs or or characters oh, um, yeah. personalities um and you know or the idea that oh if there's a meet cute then it must be romantic you know if i meet someone in a cute way then <laughs> maybe there's something there or uh if something bad is happening then i shouldn't you know uh run upstairs because that's not a good thing to do in a horror movie you know there are all these <laughs> tropes that we're very very familiar with and of course they don't count in real life. Of course they don't work in real life, except if enough people believe that they do, people are going to start acting like they do. And, you know, this does not necessarily change any physical laws, but it sure changes some social ones. And so for the characters in the book, particularly who have a strong case of this, um, it's, it can hamper them, especially if you're not aware of it, if you're not careful about it, it can make you think things are going to happen in certain ways that they're not, but it also provides a kind of intuition um, in the motivations and the expected actions of other people. And so it's this, this real double-edged uh, blade, like, like many um, uh, neurodivergences. And so it's, this, is, this is what's interesting for the character, but also very much what I <laughs> experience in my own right. life. I, um, one of the things I, I, I think that happens, I mean, in the in the book, it's sort of accepted. And like, if somebody has a severe case, it's like, oh, I think you have a severe case of this. You better take some time and rest and, and do, you know, that kind of thing. And I think that in, in our culture, um, we have too many people who they, they know about, you know, the three act structure and the hero's journey and all these things like that. And then they fall victim to what, uh, what has been called the GI Joe fallacy, which is that knowing is not half the battle. Um, and so, you know, just because you know about the three act structure and this, this, the, the fact that I know about narrative disorder does not mean that I am immune to narrative disorder. Um, yeah. and it does not mean that I, I don't st fall for these things. And, um, that, uh, I think is one of the, the biggest dangers is that, that people will say, oh yes, I, I see this, you know, I, I know that I, I know about privilege and therefore I will not be, I will not, uh, have to. Uh, worry about over exercising my own or something along those lines. Uh, and you froze on my screen. So I'm hoping you're still there or I'm still there. Uh, are people still, and this is where you're going to chat, still seeing us here? Um, yep. Of course, it freezes on the chat. Okay, you can still see and hear me is Malka frozen. Thanks, Conspicuous Compiler. Um, all right, well, and hopefully she will jump back in. This is a great time for us to talk about the Indiegogo and fun things that happen on Indiegogo. For example, this morning, I spent a good 45 minutes updating the content, the main content story with all of the new items that are available today. And when I came in this morning to the office, I looked at it and somehow all of the edits that I made on the story were gone. So uh, we're going to put those back eventually. Uh, but in the meantime, you can see some new things, including I see Reckless Robbie's here on Twitch. Um, you guys, we have, yeah. Uh, we'll hopefully have Malka come back 
into the Zoom chat. But in the meantime, I'm going to talk about the cool stuff that we have available, including the dice boxes. Now, um, there are featured right now. Dragon and Heart Dice Tray is there. Uh, Reckless Robbie, I see you there on the stream in the chat. I'm really glad you're here. And I want to say this is still my favorite perk uh, between this and the tokens. In fact, I can actually show you my favorite token, which is this one. It's not focused. This is the world builders token. So these are things that you can do with your players. And the neat thing about it is, is that, you know, you could, if you play virtually, then you just both order one and um, you can say to the player, hey, go ahead and take the world builders token out because I want to give you that, that ability. And what happens is in the middle of a game, uh, you could they say, oh my goodness, I, I need to create some chaos or, oh, we ran out of supplies or, um, oh, I have this ice spell, but there's no water around to use it on. And what happens when you play the World Builders Inspiration Token is that you will roll one die eight and that number of goats, ducks, chickens, or gallons of water appear. So I could say, oh my goodness, I need to create some chaos. I want to have uh, two ducks, two chickens, two goats, and two gallons of water all appear. And then you freeze the water and you push all the animals out in it and watch them slipping around. Um, is Mr. Rothfuss truly of capable? Of yes, actually. Uh, I can tell you, uh, this is one of the tenets of polyamory. Love is in fact infinite. Time is not. Uh, so, and neither is energy. So yes, while he is truly capable of loving everyone, he is not capable of loving everyone at the same time. So if you get that $7 one, uh, what will end up happening is that for a brief moment, uh, he will go on stream and say, conspicuous compiler, I love you. And for that moment, you are truly loved. And then he will go on and mention someone else. Doesn't mean you're not still loved, just means that the temporal manifestation of that love has come to an end. So uh, yeah, that's, uh, I hope that that has all been taken down. Uh, we should put a clip of that and um, definitely save that as the explanation for that particular uh, one. Uh, now I don't have one of the world builders token boxes here. Uh, what I have and I can show is the uh, prototype that Robbie sent. Now this is one, this is one that, that kind of sold us on the thing. Um, he has done them before with this great laser engraving of like the dragon on here. But what I think is cool and what I think is neat, oh, uh, thanks. Yay, did I do that right? I don't know. I don't know what the kids do these days with the whole hand motion. Oh, wait, wait, aren't I supposed to do it? Like, there we go. Pretty sure that's, that's the new flex, right? All right. Um, so I want to show the part that I think is cool about this box as a, a design aspect. You see that little thing there? So that is makes this wood flexible. And that means that when I take it off, you can see another one right there. So when I put this on, I hook it on there and pull, and then it keeps it still. And if I want to then have my dice held up there, and again, take it, put it in there, and then I have a space for my dice. And um, I will say that I don't have in front of me the right kind of dice. These are old uh, Gary Kahn, big giant dice. Um, but when we have our world builders dice sets out, these will fit inside of here. So, um, I just want to say, Robbie, I, I love that you made these things. I love that we get to uh, sell them as part of this. And uh, you are awesome to, uh, to have us, let us take part in this. Um, so while Malka is gone, I will also um, talk about something else that she has done aside from the cool infomocracy stuff. Um, not having Dr. Older too. Yeah, sorry about the wonky stuff. And that is, um, the Sparkle Salon. Now the Sparkle Salon, uh, Beth is going to put the, sorry, Cat McBeth is going to put that in the chat, uh, what that exactly is. 
but it is what happens when six brilliant scientists and writers gather for a chill chat. It's called a science fiction sparkle salon. And um, what that is, is it's Dr. Elder, who you've already had here uh, talking, along with Annalie Newitz, who is a Once upon old time. favorite of the Joko Cruz, um, an excellent author, uh, and um, the recent recently book is Four Lost Cities, which is a um, an interesting deep dive into civilizations that have passed and what maybe made them pass. Um, Arkady Martin, whose books A Memory Called Empire and A Desolation Called Peace are just some of the most original world building I've ever seen, um, some of the most unpronounceable names I've ever come across. Uh, they make me want my new granddaughter to be named um, like after a number and a flower because that's what a civilization tends to have. Um, but apparently uh, um, 28 Buttercup was not in the running when my, my daughter had the baby. Um, Amal El Motar, um, who co-authored This Is How You Lose the Time War. Uh, and in case you're wondering, that is the reason I have this little uh, cardinal on my bag here is because of that book. It is one of the best science fiction slash, well, I will say it is a, it is a time travel love story. Um, and it is just beautiful. I mean, it's the kind of, kind of book that makes you want to just, you know, some films, you can take any frame out and just like put it on your wall and it's art. Uh, that's a book where you could pretty much take any paragraph and write it in calligraphy and it would be a poetry. It's just amazing. Um, and then also Karen Lord, who I'm not familiar with, but um, uh, definitely Malka was talking before the show about how great that is. And Katie Mack, who wrote The End of Everything. To go back, why I was talking about all these people, they get together and just have a chat on this YouTube. Um, and they do a what they call a freewheeling conversation about life, the universe, and everything, which happens to be also a perk that you get when you uh, you can get here at the um, World Builders campaign. You see how I circled back there? That that is why I actually get paid is because I have the ability to craft narrative even on the fly and make it, you know, all come back to the purpose, which is to raise money for World Builders. Um, and incidentally, um, I'm going to take this opportunity to talk about the fact um, of what is known colloquially in the uh, nonprofit world as the overhead myth. Um, and it, it, it is a well-intentioned but unfortunately destructive narrative, since we we're talking about um, the, the narratives and ideas. And it's the idea that if you are a nonprofit, um, it means that you should, for some reason, not be uh, paying uh, any amount of money, you know, the less amount of money you spend on overhead, um, which is considered to be basically paying the people that do the work um, or paying for things like renting an office, uh, things like that, the less money you spend on that and the more money that goes directly towards the mission is all there. Now, to some extent, this is designed, the idea of this myth is that somehow it's more virtuous if you spend less. Now. World Builders, as you know, is 100% pass-through, with the exception of this fundraiser that we do every year. If we do a fundraiser for um, uh, Project Hope, 100% of the money from that fundraiser goes there. Now, this is not because we are better than any other nonprofit. It is because we are more fortunate than most other nonprofits. Most other nonprofits don't have a Pat Rothfuss that founds them and then licenses his immensely popular intellectual property um, to do that. We don't have people like Larry Dixon, who you know gives us the map of Valdemar to uh, to use. We don't have um, you know neat products like the Name of the Wind art deck uh, that came out. And just so you know, this actually is my own personal deck that I helped fund uh, the Kickstarter long before I ever got involved with world builders. Um, we don't have things like that. We can help keep the lights on by offering things like that. And that means we get to give 100% later on. But there are some things that take some problems that in order to address them, it takes 80% of the overhead to have the resources to do that. So 
it's kind of a myth to say that there's just yes there are there are definitely some places that uh, do actually try and, and scam things but they're few and far between compared to the number of places that suffer because people look at them and say what do you mean it takes 80 percent of your stuff to to address this problem um, it's a matter of resource allocation and there's a presumption to use the amount of money that goes towards overhead and, and what qualifies as overhead is you know, honestly, also a, a whole other issue. Um, if you Google the overhead myth, um, you will have it. Um, you can also, there's a um, talk, a really great TED talk and a book by a person whose name is out of my head at the moment. Um, and uh, I want to say Pagliata, is that it? Overhead myth, myth. TED Talk, do the overhead myth TED Talk, Dan Pallada, that's what it is. And he did a really fantastic um, thing called how we think about um, the, the uh, how we think about charities is dead wrong. And of course, I ended up closing my Twitch chat window too, so I can't even post that. There we go. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. You already have that. All right. Um, I'm also going to quick check my email and see if Malka wrote me something that says, hey, I'm not going to be able to come back. Um, nope. Nope. I don't have anything there. So I don't know if she's still trying to get on or what happened. All right. Um, and yeah, so we are, I, I do have, um, well, first of all, I'll say, does anybody have any other questions about stuff that's in there? Um, I see we have some more um, subscriptions. Thank you. Or, hey, comments about the uh, the Twitch stream, too, would be fun to see. Um, yeah, that's a crit. You have to have some overhead or you can't operate. I mean, there are some nonprofits that operate entirely off of volunteers. But if you are able to volunteer your time, that is a measure of privilege as well. It means that you are somehow being able to pay your bills, have your needs provided for by someone else. And it's great. If you're doing that, that is wonderful. Thank you very much. But it's unfair to expect that everyone can do that and that only people who have that kind of privilege should be allowed to do the kind of work that is necessary. Because that's also how certain problems like poverty and hunger end up not being addressed by people, by the people who are best able to say what is needed. Um, so yeah, the subscription money can go towards our overhead. Oh, thanks, Unlikely Mass. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, well, you know, Elevens just can just be gray monologuing here. My, my staff, I, I've told my staff before that I could sit here and, and fill a, a time, you know, they're like, I don't know if that sounds like you could talk about that for a long time. Like, oh, you have no idea. Uh, hey, Spoys, subscribed as well. Thank you so much. Really appreciate that. Um, and I, I'm imagining that somewhere on the screen, there's a little like appearance of a uh, person there. You know, I was just going to say, ja Jamie, uh, if we can't want to have the voice of the, the geek in the van, uh, I, won't, I won't put you on the spot, but if you want to talk with me about this stuff, I will say, while I can certainly monologue, I did a podcast for years that was just me. It always works better if you have two people um, talking. I think they can and, hear me now. Can, can, you, yes. can you hear me now? Good. Hype train incoming. Oh gosh, a hype train? What? I am Holy not Dr. Cow. Maka Older, but I am here to save the day. Limited time to earn exclusive emotes. What, what do we do to earn exclusive emotes? <laughs> Welcome to I don't, Twitch Grace. I don't 100% know what a, uh, emotes are, to be honest with you. Wait, I just clicked on it. Level one emotes. I see some that are locked. Little Skyfay has used eight bits. Thank you. Little bits. All right. So Julia and Alyssa have been helping me get the new Twitch setup up and going. We finally are in the affiliate program, and that means that we 
can take donations through stream. Everything that you donate through, anything you donate through stream goes through our PayPal. So it's like straight to us. It's not getting cuts taken by someone else. It doesn't count for like our GDG total. We'll probably stick it on there at the end. Um, but yeah, everything that you can, you know, cheer, subscribe, raid, host, all of that good stuff. Um, our channel has cute little Dracus alerts provided by the incredibly talented Julia and Alyssa. Huge round of applause. Uh, we're going to be continuing upgrading all of it. We're going to have some animations. I'm going to fix layouts as we go. This is our first 11 Z's <laughs> of the, the fundraiser. So I, I'm also excited because two of the cardigans from the, uh, the Lady Astronaut Club have been claimed already. Ooh. Lady um, astronaut cardigans. Yes, yes. Now, and, and these are not so. These cardigans are special because it's not like we just said, "Oh, hey, there's a blue cardigan. Let's do this." No, we had information from Mary Robinette. We have another um, a designer who uh, I'm not 100 percent sure. Yeah, I can I can say um, uh, a designer from uh, Montreal uh, mm. who goes by the name of goes by the handle of Unusual Frequency. Um, uh, sourced this in a way, you know, we wanted to make sure that, you know, it turns out if you're going to have things bulk produced like that, they have to be in China. Oh, wait, Malka's back. Um, oh. All right. All right. I'll get out of here. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for so much in for there, patience Jamie. and support. You're amazing. Yes. Yay, you made it back. Oh, I'm still not hearing you. Oh, here we go. Yay, you're back. I'm not hearing anything. I can see you though. Okay, we have no audio. Hang on. Now you're connecting. There you go. Now you have sound. There. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. No worries. Someone knocked over the Wi-Fi router. Oh. Um, <laughs> oh, been there. Yes. Yeah. Are I we, mean, we are we live? Are we still running, or did you? We close are. Up? We are. Oh no, no, no. We. Uh, you. You gave me a chance In to do a case? long monologue on. Um, what did I talk <laughs> about? I talked about uh, the overhead myth in nonprofits. I. Uh, I started talking about. Oh, the uh, sparks. I was going to talk about that. Like, yeah, and, and <laughs> you actually have the thing in there about life, the universe, and everything, and that is one of our donation tiers. Uh, people can donate forty-two dollars, and it's just for life. The, the the joy of donating that amount. So, yeah, it actually we we've had a nice long monologue. We talked about the new Twitch stream, but now that you're back, um, thank you for coming back. First of all, thanks for making that happen. Um, uh oh, you're frozen again. So long. Yeah, it's still it's still not perhaps at full power. Okay, um, well we can hear you. So, do you want to talk about the Sparkle Salon? Uh, okay. Sure. <laughs> um, sure. So this was one of these magical internet things where um, Meg Frank, who's a friend of mine, uh, just kind of said on Twitter, "I would love to." hear this group of people talk about anything and we all thought it was a great idea and Arizona State fortunately also thought it was a great idea and helped us out with a little bit a tiny bit of funding and their YouTube channel like very very minimal assistance to make this thing happen very minimal but that I'm very grateful for uh, I'm just saying that you know you can make wonderful things happen without a ton of money uh, and they but they they put a lot of time into it and so we had a wonderful conversation with this amazing group of um, people who are writers and also scientists. So, you know, I'm a sociologist. I study uh, disasters and organizations. Um, but Annalie Newitz, who was there, has just obviously has studied a lot of different things and writes a lot of really excellent nonfiction, including their latest uh, Four Lost Cities, which I'm reading, which is so, so interesting. Um, and Arkady Martin, who has a background in... Um, the Byzantine Empire, actually, as well as doing all sorts of su sustainability and climate change adaptation stuff in her, her job now. Um, Katie Mack, who is an astrophysicist, and um, Karen Lord, who's been an anthropologist, and Amal uh, El-Mokhtar, who, who studies 
um, romantic literature. So we had just this, this group of people who, who, who write, but also study something. And we kind of got together and decided we would talk about whatever we wanted to. We had a very, we have a very kind of loose, just start us off thing of focusing on the, the non-writing job of one or another in each episode, but we really kind of go on all these tangents and allow each other to geek out as much as we want to about whatever we're talking about. Um, and it's an enormous amount of fun. And we've also, thanks to that funding from, from Arizona, we've, we've added some video pop-ups and some graphics and some maps and <laughs> things to make it uh, more understandable. And so the first episode is up now. We've already filmed the second one and we're doing the, the production and we're, we're gearing up for the third. So it's a really, really just, it's such a ball. So I, I hope people enjoy it as, enjoy watching it as much as we enjoyed filming it. That's it. That's a movie. Yep. No, I mean, that, that is, that is great. And I mean, it, it brings me back to the, you know, the whole power of story. Um, and I mean, mm-hmm. uh, as, as someone who, you know, in the nonprofit world, um, you know, we're, we're somewhat working to put ourselves out of business. Like if we're trying to solve a problem, the mm-hmm. idea is generally that the problem will get solved. And at that point, you won't need to have the nonprofit anymore, right? Um, that's, that's what's supposed to happen. We're, we're working towards our own obsolescence. Um, and uh, to some extent, that 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 leads to a whole other topic of to what extent does the existence of nonprofits give corporations and institutions an excuse not to solve the problems because they can always point and say and countries yes you know that that, you know oh well you know we we just gave one percent of our profits to stop hunger so you can't say we're not doing anything about it while they then are you know propagating the systems that cause the hunger um but Within world builders specifically, um, you know what we what we really have is we have the power of story, and we are run off of the power of particularly Pat Roth's stories, you know that that literally selling licensed products that that he has uh, helped let us sell helps us pay the bills and then do the pass through, which hopefully helps out other situations. Um, but at the same time, there's a my personal thought was that you know. I, I want to find the story that that is so engaging and so of, of the better world that it makes people go, oh yeah, that's the that's the world that I want. Now for me, that's Star Trek. Okay, I I like I I'm a, I'm a Trekkie, um, and I can list a zillion reasons why Star Trek is better than Star Wars for just in the idea of because it helps us imagine a better world as opposed to a worse one. Um, but. That being said, uh, that's um, that's an easy low hanging fruit when somebody says, "Tell me a tell me a story that imagines a better future," and we've talked a lot about your infomocracy, which I think when we first talked, I called it dystopia, and I think you said, "No, it's not a dystopia. It's a you know, it's." I mean, it gets called that a lot, and I very much feel that you know, if that's what it's saying to readers, you know, you know that's okay. That's if that's what it means to them, they're people are welcome to interpret it that way. I, I don't think of it as, as a dystopia. I think of it as someone hopeful, um, but because it gets called that so much really makes me wonder if I'm just more cynical than most of the world <laughs> to think something is hopeful that other people think is a dystopia. Um, I also have like pretty high rigorous standards for what counts as a real dystopia. But yeah, but yeah I mean, I, I think I think it's, it's, a, it's, it's something that's not perfect, very far from a utopia, but I do think it is hopeful and, and it offers um, so some visions of, of good changes that could be made as well as some warnings about not so great ones. So would you, would you say that there's a difference between a story that is hopeful because the protagonists somehow survive the system versus a story that actually imagines a better system? I mean, and, and if it's imagining a better system, does that just make it boring for us because we it's it's um it, everything is happiness and roses and there's no conflict. I mean, is it how do you how do you tell the story? If there's a perfect system, it's both boring and unrealistic. Okay. Um, and and it's unrealistic for a couple of reasons. I mean, one, you know, we don't expect to achieve perfection, but the other is nothing stays static. So even if something is perfect for the moment, unless it's a very self-adaptive system, it's 
you know, it's still, it's not going to be perfect in the next second uh, as things change. And so, yeah. which is another reason that, you know, I thought it was really important that my book be about processes, be about how these changes happen and the people and organizations that make these changes happen. Um, and the book, my, my trilogy is very much about the evolution of the system over the trilogy. And the first one is about the, yes. the, the system that exists. But as you read the rest of the trilogy, it's very much how that system is changing and adapting and how people are fighting over what it becomes next. Um, so, and yeah, if you honestly, if you look at people overthrowing a system is the bulk of what we call dystopias today. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the sort of tradition, more traditional dystopia like 1984, um, or the, the book, at least, of A Handmaid's Tale, don't turn out so well, right? Uh, but we, we name a lot of things dystopias today that actually are like resistance narratives, very hopeful resistance narratives that we call dystopias so that we don't have to look at how similar the bad situation is to our situation today. It's, it's, I really think it's a distancing mechanism um, that we use to not examine the ways that these stories reflect our present. Um, and, and that's the thing. I mean, you know, our, all of our narratives reflect the time that they're from, no matter how speculative they are, no matter how much imagination they, they employ, um, they, they really reflect the problems and concerns and hopes of the time of the authors who are, who are writing them. And so, you know, that's the other reason why I think stories are so important. All of our stories are very much rooted in real life, right? Um, and I also actually have a, a very small um, nonprofit donation thing that I do with my books uh, where I, I donate from my, my earnings on each of them to a nonprofit that is related to what's going on, what the books are about. And I do that in part, you know, because I feel very fortunate that I am able to earn um, something like a living from, from doing something that I love very much. Uh, but also because for me, it's, it's the, the like really more kind of more serious thing about it is making sure that people understand how the books are rooted in the present and that the things that I write about, people are out there working on them right now, trying to solve those problems or at least address them and make them somewhat better if not solve them. Um, and just by buying the book and reading, you know, actually whether you read the story or not, um, but hopefully you do, just by buying the book, you're already doing something to affect those issues. And then if you read the book and you think about it and you, you know, you start engaging with those issues yourself, that's the next, that's another step, but that, but that it is really in the real world. Um, and so I think that's very related to what you're doing with world builders as well. You know, you're, you're saying that these are, this, these stories that we come up with, however fantastical they are, are very connected to the problems that we see in the real world. And that's why, you know, we want to use those stories to drive making this world a better place. Okay, we are going to clip that and use that from now on, just so you know. <laughs> that, that was the, that was definitely the, uh, the, the uh, wonderful um, quote of the, of the whole piece here, because you, you talked about how nice we are. Thank you. <laughs> um, I, I'm, uh, I'm really, uh, glad that you, you do that with, with the, um, the parts that you, you create. I, I sometimes, um, worry because you're right. We do say, you know, Hey, help change the world by buying cool stuff, you know, or you're going to be a, you're going to be a geek anyway. You're going to want to buy cool stuff anyway. How about you do it in a way that then helps solve the problems in the world? Um, but at the same time, it's important, like, for example, we were talking just before you were able to come back on, we were talking about um, a cardigan that we had created um, for the Lady Astronaut uh, series. And, um, you know, the, 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 the fact is, it is made in China, because if you're going to have custom cardigans made, they have to be made overseas in that situation. Um, but what we were able to do was we were able to find a place in China, well, we the unusual frequency who is kind of took over that project and worked with Mary Robinette um, to make it researched and found a place in China where the people are paid a living wage. Um, they are paid decent hours. It is not done by slave labor. Um, it is done, you, you know, in a, in a um, factory that meets certain standards for environmental impact uh, and things like that. So you, you have to, you know, find a way to do it in an ethical way and then also, you know, pay the author who imagined it and pay the people, everybody along the line. Um, 
and it becomes such a complex system and such mm. a nuanced system. And, and that's where the, the narrative disorder, I think, and the imagination fails us is that people seem to have fallen out of thing, out of line with nuance. Like they, they're it's either a good or bad. And- I mean, I think you're absolutely right on that. And we need to see things in a nuanced way. Uh, but I think, you know, that the, there's also um, what, what you've done there in terms of that intentionality is I think also what we strive to do as authors, you know, if we are thinking about the, if we are trying to write things that as, you know, as I said in that New York Times article, and as we've been talking about at the beginning, that peel away assumptions and that remove the things we take for granted and question them and interrogate them. Oh gosh, you look frozen and I'm on such a- Oh no, no, you're good. Uh, you're good. <laughs> but it's that same, it's that same intentionality of not just assuming that, you know, doing this thing is, is the right thing to do, but thinking about how do we do it better? Yeah. Um, when, when I think of um, a better, a, a better system, um, <laughs> are you there still? Are you able to see us? Oh no. Oh boy. <laughs> Am I out or is she? <laughs> uh, okay, so you can see me and not her. Oh boy, uh, how sad. I was about to talk about the, the culture. Oh, there she goes. Oh man, internet, come <sighs> Boy, it is it is a rough day for the internet today. Uh, I mean, the good news is we can fix it in post because that thing that she said is the perfect thing to end on. There you and are. I it. Hey. And she's back. <laughs> uh, you're muted for some reason. There we go. There we go. Back and very clear too. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I finally the five G finally came back up. Yay. Um, <laughs> now at the end of the hour um, uh, yeah I'm, if it's okay with you we can go a little over or if you need to go I totally understand no no, no not a problem <clears throat> all right great um I was about to uh ask about um <clears throat> you know aside from the the low-hanging fruit of Star Trek being a you know post-abundant society a post-scarcity society um which is kind of what I think the Maybe one of the first, I don't know if it's the first step, but it's kind of the, the golden apple there is the idea of, you know, um, sustainable abundance is, is the, what we're looking for. Um, I always think of Ian Banks uh, culture series um, mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, to some extent it is, oh, look, we solve things and there's still issues. There's still conflict, both from human nature and things. But it's, it's like this fun, hey, what, what can we do when we're not having to worry about all these things, you know, it, it's kind of like the, the argument for universal basic income, you know, yeah. it's like, oh, but if people don't have to work, what will they do with their time? Turns out they'll do all kinds of things, you know, it, it, it actually, uh, um, I, I love the way that works. Uh, do you have any particular examples um, of, of things that maybe you, you would call as that kind of speculative resistance or things that might help change things? Or imagine, yeah. imagine change. Yeah, of course. Um, and you know, if if I start sort of from the perspective of of infomocracy, um, which is really thinking about information and democracy and how these two things fit together, and you know, I basically come to the conclusion that democracy to to be worthy of the name, it must have uh, a access accessible, free public education, quality public education and accessible free quality information. That without education and information, democracy, it's 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 not even worth calling it that because it's it's saying, you know, we're giving this uh, power of, of choice to the people, but we're not gonna give them what they need to make an informed choice, to, to make a good choice. Um, and, you know, I think that that's sort of where and there's a lot of places where democracy has been falling down, but one of the places is this idea that as long as people vote on stuff, you don't have to worry about anything else. 
Um, and that's that's just not the case. So, you know, education information, which is kind of an easy thing to say and a very, very, very hard thing to do, but you know, we don't have to do it perfectly. We do have to do it better than we're doing okay. now. I was going to ask if quality of information and quality of education is is the because that those are big words that have a lot we're, of yeah they're they're big words that are hard to define and mean different yeah. things to different people which is you know a, a big issue uh, but we can definitely do better than we're doing now yeah. and and I think you know we have to it's not. It's, I mean, part of it is not letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. But the other thing is just remembering that this is iterative, that we have to make it better than what we got and that the people who come after us have to make it better than what they got. And, you know, if, if we keep pushing it in the right direction, things get better. Um, so uh, that's that's kind of the big one for me from the perspective of of infomocracy and the issues that I talk about in there. Uh, and, and of course, there's a lot of thinking about what that means, particularly in the book, uh, as well as in some of the things I've read outside of, I've written outside of it. Um, and I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of other stuff as well. There's, there's so much that's like, we should just do it, but we don't. Um, you know, I really think that we do so much. We're in a place right now where there's been this whole cultural trend towards uh, thinking that, as you know, as Adam Soro has said, the cruelty is the point to thinking that for a thing to be the right thing to do, it has to be sort of hard nosed and not worrying about people or individuals or feelings or uh, the vulnerable or any of these things. And you know, the, there's there's sort of this idea that that if you know, for an economic policy to be real and worthwhile, it must be hard. You know, this whole austerity thing. Um, and that you know, for foreign policy to be real, you have to you have to be uh, hawkish and difficult and not worry about, you know, the poor people who are going to get bombed because that's not important. What's important is national security and other objectives. And, you know, those, those are actually abstractions and we don't know that being horrible is better for those things. Uh, we really don't. This is this big cultural assumption that is, is baked into a lot of our discussions. And so, you know, I would, I would like to see a real, shift on that for people to at a minimum interrogate it and then you know if we have to make assumptions let's assume that being humane is better for our foreign policy and our economics because it probably is um you know it's probably better for everyone in our economy if if there's a living wage it's, it's probably <laughs> is. if you like yeah. if you look at economic theory it probably is and and if we kind of assume that we first then at least people aren't dying of starvation and doing horrible things in order to survive while we figure out what works. Um, so right. that's another thing, like just totally shift our mindset around. And, and it's so hard to get rid of because there is this sense of like, you know, the tough, hard nosed person who doesn't care about people is going to make the right decisions. Like how hard is that pushed? Uh, in our culture across a, a bunch of different um, axes and, and sector areas. Well, and, and it's a system that has rewarded, uh, I think the right term is sociopath, is that right? <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. I, I was gonna make something, I wanna say psychopath, sociopath, but it's like there there is a reward for being that way in, in some yeah. sectors. And it, and it's and uh, you know, and we can look at, at why that's so, but also the way it's talked about is not and yes, it is talked about as this is the way you win, right? Mm -hmm. You know, um, nice guys come last or whatever. But that's part of it. But there's also refugee this from hustle thing, culture, yeah. <laughs> right. There's also this bigger thing, which is like it's not just that the individual wins, but it's better for society as a whole, right? If the people need to, you know, how often in politics do people talk about making the tough decisions uh, that they that you know. It, and um, well, we have to do this. I mean, the whole austerity discourse in economics, yes, um, which has no, you know, there's not really evidence. I mean, first of all, we do not know what we're doing in macroeconomics. I have a master's in economics. I'm just going to tell you that um, I'm not an economist, <laughs> but so enough. It makes me feel much better on my checking account. Thank you. Studies <laughs> <laughs> to know that we we don't actually know much about how economics works, and it changes very quickly as as society changes. So most of it is made up. There, and there's not a lot of evidence, but there is this push to say, 
uh, you know, if we were doing nice things, then obviously we wouldn't be making the right decisions. We'd be making nice decisions without considering that those can be the same thing, that very right. often those are the same thing. Um, so that's, that's another, like, that's more of a sort of, I don't know, soft power cultural, it, and it turns into hard stuff, but like, it's such a pervasive belief. Uh, that just getting rid of that belief and even just starting from scratch, let alone what I think really think is, is you know, believing the opposite, believing that if we are humane, if we think of ourselves as a society that takes care of, of each other, if we start with designing for the most vulnerable and designing for the people yes. who designing need the access people with the, the most, yes. it's going to yes. be better for everybody. If we could assume that yeah. and just try that way out for a while and, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. accumulate evidence, I would like that. That would be great. I, I uh, so much, so much great stuff there. <laughs> that um, uh, the that is one of the things that, that people have talked to us about about world builders uh, because we insist on paying a living wage to all of our employees and uh, um, and staff. And uh, you know, some people have brought it up. Well, but but aren't you supposed to be sending all your money to this other people? I mean, you can't afford to pay these things. And I'm like, you have to. Uh, I, I think there's even some there's, there's some Dao De Jing things of the, you, know, you start locally. If you can't, and, and, and the way I explain to people, I'm like, if, if world builders can't afford to do what it does without exploiting the people that work for it, then it shouldn't exist. Like mm -hmm. that, that, that is not, there needs to be a different organization that can do that. Um, and, uh, and I find it so ironic uh, within you know uh, the, the U.S. culture, after all of the talk about we have to have a living wage, we have to go to fifteen dollars. Oh no, we couldn't possibly. We couldn't possibly, um, especially in rural towns like Stevens Point, where we're based. Um, you know, it's like it's argued that we can't possibly do that. And now, if you walk around, the starting entry level jobs are all saying you know fourteen, fifteen dollars an hour. Absolutely, come in full benefits. You know, flex time, things like that. And I'm like, apparently all it took was a pandemic. You know, we, we had two ways to, we, we were gonna get there no matter what, we had two ways to get there, one kicking and streaming, the other one intentionally. And apparently we chose the kicking and screaming way, but at least we're there, I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's really, and, and it comes back to, to the storytelling and this, um, right. this showing things that are possible because I mean, for me, the other thing that I, uh, the other sort of principle I use a lot, particularly in my, my research and my academic work is comparative. Um, comparisons aren't perfect, but if you can show people that somewhere else, in fact, has a healthcare system that does not cause hundreds of thousands of bankruptcies and, you know, kill people every year, and it still functions, like people still become doctors, people still work in hospitals, um, and people get care, and it's less expensive and has better outcomes, like, and, and a lot of people just absolutely refuse to hear or believe that, uh, but but showing people that or <laughs> you know well I mean but, but I I mean I, I think that but at the same time it feels like it I mean it it feels like there is a, an immense power for people to sort of la 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 you know the, and, and and, and yeah. I don't know how to get past that I don't I I I I thought the answer would be making information accessible unfortunately. I mean, how, how do you feel having seen like the, even the last year, but in terms of, I, I, I can only imagine, I mean, for me, it was nightmarish, but for you who have done so much work in studying how people handle information, I mean, do you just like have a very well-stocked liquor bar that you just- <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, It is, it's, it's really, really, really uh, painful, um, especially when it's people that you know and care about. Mm -hmm. uh, which I think demonstrates just how difficult and pervasive this is. However, um, you know, I always remember that we are in an information environment that is deeply flawed, right? Um, there's actually a, a paper I was just looking out at on Twitter that came out. I was looking at the thread. I haven't read the paper itself yet, um, but a paper that I think just came out uh, which is about how basically there should be some stewardship of our, our information ecosystem because um, there's been such a, a dramatic and rapid change in how we interact and share information. 
and nobody is thinking about it in any sense other, well, not nobody, I shouldn't say that because there are a lot of people thinking about it, but the, the people who are involved in making it happen and designing it and enacting it are mainly concerned about making people see ads. And that, that is maybe not the best. So this paper is, I just wanna, you know, since I'm mentioning it, I wanna credit it. It's by um, Joseph Beck Coleman et al. There's a long et al. Um, Carl T. Bergstrom, Mark Alfano, Wolfram Barfus. So there's a, there are a lot of people involved. Um, it's in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences of the United States of America. And I will put the- so if you put the link in the chat, we can uh, yeah. put it in. Um, but you know, so that's just that's just an example that I happen to see today. Uh, but you know, these these we we are in an environment that is both it's it's intentional about profit. It's also had time to sort of accrue these uh, really you know close to monopolies. You know, really really excessive um, market shares of news. Not just talking about social media, but you know, if you look at what's happening with newspapers, if you look at what's happening with cable news. It's a very, very bad environment for information right now. Uh, and so, you know, it's not entirely surprising that people are, are a bit shaken. We're also, I think today, really expected to, um, to, to, to process and be aware of and make decisions based on lots of things that are either abs sorry, that are either abstract or very far away from us in a way that people weren't in the past. So we're expected to have opinions about the economy and we're expected to make decisions based on those opinions um, in terms of who we vote for or what stocks we buy or, and the economy is this huge abstraction that actually nobody can see all the data about or make sense of. Like that's not something that even if you're an economist, you're not gonna see the whole picture. And most people are not economists and, and see very, very little of the picture. And yet we're still expected to not just believe this exists, but really use it in our lives. And that's that's just one example. I mean, there's so many things now that we are supposed to care about and believe in and, and make important decisions based on. So we're, we're, we've got this new sort of gulf of abstraction um, in the information that we deal with. Uh, and, you know, I think that that also it, it, it really shakes how people um, decide what is important, what is credible. Uh, but but at the same time, you know, I, I think also of examples that I have seen of people coming back from very, very bad information, misinformation places. Um, I had a, a friend that I knew. Um, actually, when I worked for an NGO in Darfur, this was a, an, another um, aid worker, and he was, uh, he's, he is as far as now, uh, a white man from South Africa. And one time when we were talking, he told me that he had been brought up believing apartheid was good um, and the right thing. And he, he told me that basically he only got over it when he was in the, the military and it was fully integrated by that point. And he, he said, you know, if you are whatever, doing a march and you're thirsty and hungry and miserable and you stop thinking about the person next to you as a certain color and you think of them as the person next to you who's passing you the water bottle, like you're just not gonna, and that that sort of um, uh, just personal experience just destroyed that 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 very dense bubble of misinformation for him. And, and we've seen it, you know, I think there've been um, some good examples. There's a long uh, New Yorker piece about the woman who did Twitter for the, the Westboro Baptist Church and how she kind of got out of that through interacting with, um, with people largely online. Um, you know, I don't think it has to be necessarily in person, but it does have to be personal. It has to be, I am talking to this real person and they are not what I have been, what I have been told. Um, so, you know, I think that we're in, we're also in this kind of weird place between mass information and personal information. Um, oh yeah, that's a whole other, yeah. That's a whole other thing. And, and also how we distinguish between the two, because of course there are the bots out there that pretend to be personal. Um, and, and sort of, and so that, that whole thing as well, I think is something that's, that's messing with. So it's, it's really hard. It's really terrible. Um, there are a lot of smart people out there working on it. And, and, you know, some of the, the, the systemic and structural problems are very easy to see and we could change them again. You know, if we had the political will to say, uh, no, they, these people should not own all the newspapers. Perhaps, um, but, yeah. 
you know, that would take us a certain a certain distance if we said maybe, you know, maybe we should restructure what social media looks like so that, you know, X, Y, Z. Um, there, I mean, there's a lot of different, <laughs> there's a lot, there's a lot to fix. Uh, yeah. but, but I think that, you know, we have to keep in mind that it's, you know, it's very easy to say, oh, it's human nature. And like, certainly we know that cognitively we want to believe in the things that we already believe, et cetera, et cetera. Like there, there is that. Yeah. Um, but so much of, of the problem that we're facing now is not, is not something unchangeable like human nature and human nature does change. Like, I, it, you know, if you look at the difference um, in what societies are like today from 500 years ago, 200 years yeah. ago, uh, it's massive. So or even just, um, uh, I can't remember, I was listening to the book, uh, I think it was the hit makers or something like that but they brought up the the, the shift from for gay marriage acceptance mm. of gay marriage like that just changed so amazingly quickly um and and became you know went from uh oh no long shot absolutely never just that's a science fiction thing to uh of course what's the big deal you know that kind of thing so quickly it's, um, it's it's like if you watch the west wing now half the time you're like oh, i can't yeah. believe we've still got the same issue and half the time you're like Oh yeah, we, that was we a did thing. That. Yeah, <laughs> the the question came up in chat, um, and I I honestly haven't seen it, so I can't I can't speak to it. Bo Burnham's new special uh, on Netflix, Inside. Have you seen that? I haven't seen it either, and I've heard really good things. Yeah, um, me too. And I've also heard though that it it is it is really really good, and it's a gut punch. And that's why I haven't watched it. I haven't had the really bandwidth to be like part of why I haven't things. seen it either. I will yeah. say. Um, I've heard it's a bit like uh, Hannah Gadsby's work. And if it is, yeah. I mean, I love Hannah Gadsby. So exactly I, I punch, love what yeah. she did. Um, but, but, mm -hmm. but yeah, I got punched. Uh, so sorry, I can't answer the question. I, <laughs> I've been told I should see it. I, it's sort of on my plans yeah. once I can see things that are hard again. Well, that's uh, interesting. The, the other comment that came in is uh, uh, Bass Insider was saying, I just talking about this with my ADHD coach. Uh, we were talking about sci-fi grimdark and comparing it to privileged neurotypical wellness. Um, Ooh, interesting. Yeah, that, 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 that. I don't know. It's there's kind of a, 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 a fine line there because I do think that people's brains work very differently. Um, and I think that for some people reading really dark stuff gives them uh, a kind of catharsis and it gives them uh, you know, there's, I mean, hope is great, but warnings are also important. So there's that. Yeah. yeah. Um, but you know, there is a certain grimdark for grimdark's sake that I, I find really difficult. I actually, I couldn't get past, um, season one of, of game of Thrones, for example, I, I got like the beginning of season two and I was like, you know, these people are just doing horrible things to make it feel gritty or whatever. It's, you know, it's, it's a lot along the lines of what I was talking about in terms of austerity and saying, oh, you know, only if people suffer, is it a, a good decision? Is it the real decision? Are we really, um, and, you know, I think there's, there's a, a, a heavy element of that as well in, in sort of literature and, and movies, which is, you know, it's, it's got to make you cry to be an Oscar contender, right? as if making you laugh or making you happy wasn't, wasn't also a really, really hard thing to do well. Um, so, you know, on the one hand, I really recognize the value in, in work that is difficult and that is dark, uh, whether it's a warning or whether it's someone's personal expression of what, what they've been through or whatever. Uh, on the other hand, there is, you know, it's people do manipulate that and people do do it for its own sake, as opposed to for those for those reasons, um, and and that yeah I, I, yeah yeah. I also I worry about things going wrong. Um, there's the um, always be closing speech from Glengarry Glen Ross, and I you know it, it seems like every few months some productivity coach says this is here's the lessons you should learn from this, and I'm looking at it. I'm like, this was not intended to be a, a life lesson. This was intended to show how horrible this person is. <laughs> like, yeah. What? Yeah. Does that work? Um, uh, yeah. The, the, the level of misinterpretation. Yes. Always, always a danger. Well, thank you so much for, for taking the extra time uh, to make up for the, uh, the for technical dickafuddies that we had. Um, I'm very, very sorry for that. Oh, no, I am. I am so yeah, grateful that you came back. Uh, as always, I, I, it's like your books. I could just 
read for all the time. And I could talk with you for hours. And I, I know that uh, you've given us so much to think about here. Um, so I appreciate that. Uh, is there, you said there's a new episode. We have a link to the, the Sparkle, is it what, Sparkle Salon? Mm -hmm. Is that what it's yep. called? Um, what, where else can people find your work and your writing? Um, so you can find me on Twitter probably too often. Um, I'm also going to put up a link for you to put in the chat for my uh, my WordPress site, which has a list of publications and a lot of the short ones are are free and you can just go and read them online. Um, I am still writing for, for Realm, which used to be Serial Box. I'm working on season two of Orphan Black, the next chapter right yes. now. So uh -huh. that's very exciting for any Clone Club fans out there. It's, uh -huh. it's so to write. And we've got a bunch of, we had Tatiana Maslany did the voice for the first season. I was um, but just going to ask. Yeah. <laughs> we actually have um, Evelyn Brochu and Jordan Gavaris as well. So we have three wow. of the actors from the show. It's going to be, uh, you know, with a separate narrator and and them doing the voices for the characters, which is just like it's, amazing. It's yeah. amazing. It's a lot of fun to write for, um, and I love the the show so much. So that's that's great. Um, and I am always writing books, so hopefully some of them will come out soon. <laughs> uh, and I have a, I think the latest story I have that came out was in Constellation, the latest one that's that's available online, which is a, uh, that's a bilingual journal that's new. So, but you can find it all on my website. Uh, I talk a lot on Twitter and say lots of long-winded stuff and threads. And have lots um, of threads and they're, they're fascinating and I, I really enjoy uh, Maria, you got lots of uh, thanks in the chat for um, from everyone else for being so so generous with your time and knowledge. Well, thank everyone for, for coming and watching and please um, don't forget to support world builders um, and what they do. I, I didn't get a chance to do my overhead um, myth or whatever speech, but overhead is so important for nonprofits and you know it's you just can't function without it. And we should recognize that and give organizations what they need to do, what they're doing. So um, please do support. Thank you very much. And we will hopefully have you back again later on at some point. All right, good luck. And, uh, and thank you again, it was a pleasure. All right, thank you. We'll uh, let, I'll let uh, our geek in the van tell us when we're off the thread. In the meantime, we will just stand here and